Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem, Cavalry Crossing a Ford, poem number 10 of the 43 of Drum Taps. I want to remind us that early on in inscriptions, Whitman said, my book and the war are one. And there's so many different ways we're using this as a as a kind of starting point for all of our study of the 43 poems of Drum Taps. I want to point out now that we're about to move into a series of short poems which are almost like little photographs. Pictures will be the word that he will use. Pictures are photographs that will try and capture a little bit of what the war was like. I mean, uh, you got to remember that we will see photography for the first time capturing some of the images that are captured during the Civil War that are some of the most horrific black and white images we will ever see. Of course, you can Google image those and break your heart. Um, and what Whitman is going to do is he's going to be very influenced by that technology and he's going to try to capture in poetic language, we call this showing, not telling, um, uh, what it is that he's looking at or has seen or often was the case because his work was never really on the front. His work was in the hospitals hearing from young soldiers, maybe describing what it is that they were experiencing. Now, our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. Down that left-hand side, talks with Walt from inscriptions on. I gave a set of introductory comments to drum taps, and we just finished with Centenarian's story. Now, our um, reading of Norton's will tell us that this poem remained unchanged through all of the editions except for the adding of line 6 in 1871. Um, Ethel Matheson in American Renaissance in 1941 noted that many of Whitman's poems were like the genre painting of certain Dutch and Flemish painters rendered in words. The subject homily and quiet, this selection of details suggesting the movement of life arrested for a, mo for a moment and perhaps intimating but not depicting a story. A representative group of these were assembled by the poet at this point. See, the present poem, and then obviously the following bivouac on a mountainside, army corps on the march, bivouac uh, by the bivouac's fitful flame, a site in camp at daybreak gray and dim, as toilsome I wandered Virginia's woods, I saw old general at bay and looked down for a moon. All of these will share in kind this imagistic kind of focusing of what is in front of us. Um, there is, as well, at line four, an earlier punctuation that would suddenly change the meaning of the poem, and I will point that out as we go to the reading of the poem. Now, it, uh, again, the idea here is that the, Whitman wants the reader to create the picture or the image. He said it this way, um, the reader, quote, must himself or herself construct indeed the poem. And this will be a very influential idea that will, uh, that will culminate, culminate in 20th century uh, thinking about poetry and poetics. Let's just read the poem now. Calvary crossing a ford. And of course crossing here immediately takes us back in our reading of uh, Lisa Grass to crossing Brooklyn Ferry. A line in long array where they wind betwixt green islands. They take a serpentine course, their arms flash in the sun. Hark to the musical clank. Behold, the silvery river in it, the splashing horses loitering stopped to drink. Behold, the brown-faced men, each group, each person, a picture. The negligent rest on the saddles. Some emerge on the opposite bank, others are just entering the ford, while scarlet and blue and snowy white, the guidon flags flutter gaily in the wind. Now again, it's just a picture, it's just an image, but let's go through it really quickly and kind of point out a couple of things. By the way, notice that a line in long array takes us back to Song of Myself 48. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death where they notice it's here going to be wind betwixt green islands and wind is the last word of this poem. I think, as I've said to you guys before, I think there's lots of game playing and, and Whitman's having a bit of fun here. By the way, going between green islands as we wind between green islands takes us back to our Homer and of the Odyssey especially and the Scylla and Charybdis idea of between a rock and a hard place. So there's all kinds of interesting imagery and reflecting going on back to earlier texts. They take a serpentine chorus. Remember this idea of the snake in both Banner at Daybreak as well as Fathomless. And that takes us obviously to our Paradise Lost, the idea of serpentine snaking. 
we have given full lectures, of course, for Paradise Lost to go back to that idea of uh, their arms flash in the sun. We've seen this already several times, but it's been more in anticipating of the battles that are about to happen. Here, of course, we're kind of more in the middle, maybe, of, of a possible uh, excursion to fight or whatever. Notice the use of the dash. Hark is going to challenge not only for the reader to, to, to watch, but also to participate through hearing. To the musical clank, this word clank you'll maybe remember from starting from Pominach 1, and then two times with behold, so we go from hark to watch, behold. The silvery uh, river, notice all the different um, colors that are going to be emphasized in our reading of drum taps. In the splashing horses, loitering stop to drink. This idea then of, notice this idea of, it's a pause, loitering, it's, there's a pause. Behold, the brown-faced men, you'll of course remember brown face from our study of Song of Joys. Each group, each person, a picture, the negligent rest on the saddles. By the way, do you remember in, uh, in um, Spontaneous Me, he said, what we call poems is, is, is really a picture. Do you remember, do you remember this? Um, by the way, in 1891-92, uh, there was a comma that ran this way. Each person, comma, a picture, comma, the negligent. And then it was removed for, uh, for the deathbed edition, where it read, each person, a picture, the negligent rest on the saddle. So you've got, uh, notice, loitering horses, negligent, in other words, maybe tired or frustrated, uh, horse riders, and then some are going to emerge on the opposite bank, others just entering the ford. By the way, this is the only use in all leaves of grass uh, of this word, ford. Um, of course, symbolically, th think about what's happening. If the river is time, or the river is the time that's being spent in war, you have some that are coming in as some who are exiting and going out. Obviously, there's all kind of metaphysical readings of this as well. Another dash. While scarlet and blue and snowy white, again, back to the colorations that are happening. And, of course, Whitman wasn't alone. I mean, as we've said in other lectures, um, Edgar Allan Poe loved to play that game of, of different importances at different lectures. Uh, Mask of Red Death comes to mind. You can go back and take a look at our comments there um, on learnstrong.net. And uh, um, uh, this, uh, now we go to uh, the Gaiden. Uh, flags, a, pen, a pendant, right? Um, uh, and this takes us back to the banner at daybreak, obviously. Also, this um, guidance will be used in Ethiopia, saluting the colors as well. Um, flags flutter. Gaily is a strange word given drum taps, right? No, no question. The irony of that in the in in the wind, and 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 here as well. You know this idea of of gaily takes us back to Song of the Open Road, Passage 12, so you can, you can see that. Notice that we do begin and end with the word spelled W-I-N-D, but it's two different meanings of the word. I find that fascinating as well. What are we going to say about this poem at 2A? Well, I would argue that one of the messages of this poem is that all moments of unrest, here we think, of course, of the Civil War, have their moments of rest, and this is kind of that type of moment. It's an interlude, we might say, between battles. And um, uh, we might call it the calm before this, the next military storm, obviously. At 2B, I like the word choice here, the irony of Galen. Why? Because we know that this is, again, uh, back to the title, a cavalry who is crossing a ford. Okay? And obviously, and this is so, <laughs> we lose so much, don't we, in certain, in certain approaches to our literary studies through our educational careers. But let me just say it this way. Whitman's audience would have immediately understood that crossing a ford is a whole lot like crossing the Rubicon. That is to say, the choice that Julius Caesar makes, and once that Rubicon has been crossed, there ain't no going back. And, and, a, and, a, and a reader, a astute reader, would obviously go there very quickly. So I like the word choice of, uh, as, of gaily as well here. This idea that we're, there's some irony involved in the fact that they are gaily doing what they're doing, and yet we're in the middle of this horrific war. Um, at 3A, uh, well, I've already I've, I've, I've mentioned already a couple of, uh, of names or, or references, obviously, in Julius Caesar. I want to think about Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, and especially Eliot's proof rock as examples. Think about Ezra Pound's um, uh, Metro poem as imagistic poets. Um, and uh, you can go back and take a look at our, at our lectures that we've already given at LearnStrong.net. What are, these, what are these poets trying to do predominantly? Show, not tell, right? To just give us an image that can kind of be a powerful one uh, for us. 
Finally, in 3B, what is your favorite imagist uh, poem or movie or show where we're just showing something and then you have to interpret its meaning? In other words, you make the uh, poem yourself. You make the meaning of the poem. Of course, probably the greatest, other than Whitman, of this is the great Emily Dickinson. Thank you.